apologies for anybody that works at the BL that have heard all this before. Um, legal deposit has changed in recent times and we're all pretty much getting used to it, really. Um, my presentation is just very much a high level overview of what's changed uh, from the print age and into the digital age. Um, I'm going to look at the, a bit of hit print history, uh, the passes to legislation uh, which was passed in 2013, and to look at some of the issues we're wrestling with and give you some idea of um, how we see collection development working going forward. Uh, Jenny and Helen will give you infinitesimal detail about how it all works, uh, particularly around official publications and web archiving. There's a strap line on the BL's website that says legal deposit has existed in English law since 1662. It helps to ensure that the nation's published output and thereby its intellectual record and future published heritage is collected systematically. To preserve the material for the use of future generations and to make it available for readers within the designated legal deposit libraries. Very important point. So, does anybody know who this guy is? He's called Sir Thomas Bodley. And in 1610, having built his own library in Oxford, he obtained the agreement of the stationer's company to permit the Bodleian to claim a copy of everything that was printed under royal license at that time. By that agreement, the Bodleian became the first legal deposit library in the British Isles. So it's been about for quite some time. This privilege in 1662 was extended to the Royal Library and the Library of the University of Cambridge. Not to be outdone. So, uh, and subsequently embodied in the Copyright Act of 1710 or 1709 under the Queen Anne. And until the establishment of the British Museum in 1753, the libraries of Oxford and Cambridge were, in effect, the de facto national libraries of the UK. Um, subsequent Copyright Acts followed. As you can see, there are many and varied. Um, 1801 increased the number of libraries to nine. Now, don't anybody ask me what those nine are, I really don't know. In fact, it went up to, went up to 11 at the very highest point. Um, in 1814, there was a deposit was required within one month of publication and increased the number of libraries to 11. In 1836, the number of libraries came down from 11 to 5. So at that point, it was the British Museum, the Bodleian Library, Cambridge University Library, the Faculty of Advocates in Edinburgh, and the Trinity College, Dublin. 1842 required publishers to deliver directly to the British Museum without prior demand. And the other copyright libraries had to request the item. And that procedure exists today. So publishers should deposit with the BL without being asked. Uh, and the other five deposit libraries have to ask for copies if they require them. The BL collects more comprehensively in print than it does. Uh, than the other five did. So the only relevant act of the 20th century was the Copyright Act passed in 1911, which extended the legal deposit privilege to the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. So there we are, six legal deposit libraries now. Before I move on to the um, complexity of digital, I just want to give you more of a feel about how print deposit works. The amount of content that we're getting. We currently received, in 2012-13, the DL received 122,000 new UK published monographs, 200,000 serial issues, 1,652 printed maps. We're entitled to collect music under legal deposit, so we've got 917 scores, and perhaps most controversially, 150,000 newspaper issues, and 201 place groups. The figure for books that year, uh, the ISBN agency Nielsen said that there were 150,000 new books published, and that we have collected 122,000 of them. Um, the reality is that some of those 150 were just straight reprints, and we don't collect reprints. 
you've got any questions, do please stop me. So, in the print world, the publisher sends one copy, the best available copy to the British Library. And in reality, that's the hardback of the paperback. We have a means of identifying pre-publication data, which we uh, incorporate into our CIP program. So, uh, BDS, uh, Bibliographic Data Services in, in Dumfries, uh, provide us with pre-publication records, which the publishers have provided to them. Uh, so we have marked records to load straight into our catalogue before books are published. We wait 90 days to see if the book comes in, and then we generate claim letters and send them to the publisher. 92% of our 122,000 monographs uh, have got an ISP. We tell the agency who represents the other five libraries what we're claiming, what we're receiving, and they do their own claiming from the publisher. <coughs> They've got to claim in 12 months of publication date, and then they lose the right thereafter. The publisher then sends their five copies, which are distributed to the five legal deposit libraries. Some of the five have direct agreements with certain publishers when they bypass the agency. So Oxford University has a very good relationship with Oxford University Press, essentially. <laughs> so nobody knew who Thomas, Sir Thomas Bodley was, and nobody knew this guy. <laughs> no? He's called Sir Anthony Kenny. He was a British Library Chief Executive. Was he? Chairman. 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 Um, and he was uh, commissioned in the late 90s uh, to look at publishing in the UK which had an increasingly digital focus, albeit on floppy disk and subsequently CD-ROMs and such like. Uh, you remember when CD-ROMs of uh, journal archives started appearing on the December issue of print editions? It made us think a little bit. Um, so Kenny's report saw the introduction of a voluntary code of practice for the deposit of digital publishing, which came into force in the year 2000. It's fair to say the uptake from mainstream publishing was poor. Worse than poor. Um, the adopters, if you like, um, were genealogy publishers who digitised censuses, put them on a CD and sent them in. Um, the publishers of online fanzines, which used to, and still email us weekly, monthly fanzines from different sporting clubs. Um, BBC Monitoring have routinely posited their daily email alerts for the last 15 years. Um, but there's a genuine reluctance from major publishing. Print legal deposit, however, continued to grow. Two thousand and three saw the passing of the Legal Deposit Libraries Act. There wasn't a great deal of buy-in from government to recognise that legal deposit importance in a digital age. So it was eventually a private members bill that got through, sponsored by the Ipswich MP, who was a Labour at that time, called Chris Mull. It provided a framework for the introduction of regulations to broaden the legal deposit entitlement. Fast forward 10 years. It was 10 years before those uh, <coughs> the act returned into some regulations which finally enshrined legal deposit for digital content and so on. Publishing had evolved still further, and the legal deposit libraries had taken the opportunity to build a resilient digital storage infrastructure over that time. A joint committee for legal deposit was set up, made of representatives of the legal deposit libraries and the publisher trade associations, the newspaper publishers association, the periodical publishers association, the publishers association, not the independent publishers guild. Um, 
So, the VCLD was set up to effectively overcome all the concerns that the publishing world had about handing over digital content. It was April 6, 2013, that saw the Legal Deposit Regulations enacted. This was the goal to bring in an effective system for the LDLs to build, legal deposit libraries to build a comprehensive archive of non-print publishing without imposing unreasonable burden on the publishing community. In a print world, it's very much down to the publisher to bear the costs of production and distribution for legal deposit. The idea in the digital world is that the legal deposit library's capability should have some mechanism of collecting content rather than being pushed to us. It only goes so far. That's all I want to talk about. So deposit provision was extended to cover e-books, e-journals, and other types of electronic publication, plus other material that is made available to the public in the UK on handheld media such as CD-ROM and microfilm. It also is allowed us to capture websites. However, the Act and regulations do not apply to intranets, emails, restricted personal data, cinematic film and recorded music publications. Although the regulations do cover music, sound and video contained within other text-based publications. As you can see, Boston Spa is at the hub of the UK's digital library deposit universe. Um, small village near by the bit, you're interested. Um, Almost as soon as the new regulations came into force, the Legal Deposit Libraries undertook a controlled harvest of the UK web domain. I'm going to pitch a bit of yours here. So, crawling 1.39 billion URLs across 3.86 million websites and capturing 30.84 terabytes of data. How long did it take? Uh, is it about 10 weeks? 10 weeks. Okay. Um, so we have records available in the catalogues of the six legal deposit libraries and there's full text search functionality of the entire legal deposit web archive. A 2014 domain crawl based on the UK domain um, is underway and began in June, is that right, this year? It's still going. Uh, 52 terabytes already. Okay. It's important to note that engagement with traditional commercial publishers be very much on a human level, rather than um, a machine-to-machine -machine level. We haven't sent out web crawlers to attack paywalls and authentication <laughs> barriers and say we want your stuff. You know, um, it's very much based on mutual agreement, and, and, and that leads to you know greater trust around what the BL and the legal public library is capturing the security we're applying to it, and the access levels that we're granting. In terms of publishing, as we understand it, um, there's some big names that have um, transitioned their journal deposit um, from print-based to digital. Um, we've also been allowed to capture e-only titles, so therefore the amount of content we're getting in from the publishers uh, has increased over the levels that we had in print. We expect all the larger academic publishers migrated by the end of 2016, and thereafter we're likely to focus on the larger journal, magazine publishers, um, and the long tail of small publishers who are more likely to deposit via submission portal, which we've also built, which I'll show you. Um, or via existing aggregators. Um, so we heard of Portico Digital Preservation Service. They provide us with a service where the publisher, who was perhaps already archiving their content with Portico, authorised Portico to send that content to the British Library. So we get normalised content and metadata across a disparate range of publishers which makes it easier for us to ingest into our secure digital library system. In addition to those publishers on the board, um, 
Coming on stream this year are Equinox, Elsevier, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Of those listed there, oh, <laughs> nobody told me. As well as publishers utilising uh, Portico to, to provide legal deposit content, um, some of them come directly, namely Oxford University Press and Sage, got direct feeds to us, uh, which is all, also working particularly well. Um, in terms of books, um, it's fair to say that we're less advanced than we are for, for journal processing, but um, the, the behemoth that is Ingram Content Group um, have offered to, to provide digital deposit feeds on behalf of a number of their publisher clients, those publishers that use their software for, a, a, for their digital distribution, their production and distribution systems. Um, we get automated deliveries of EPUB or PDF and associated Onyx records, which we feed into an automated processing system. So about 10% now of our annual book legal deposit intake is received in digital form. We see working with aggregators like Ingram and others in, in this supply chain as a means of receiving consistent data feeds. Legal deposit isn't just about big publishers. It's about little guys. I've written my book and I want you to have it. But I've only got it as an e-book at the moment. So we've built this, a publisher submission portal. So effectively, little publishers. And we've made a sort of cut off of around uh, 40 or 50 titles. We produce fewer than that. It's, um, they tend not to have the infrastructure in place to, for big automated deliveries. And it's very much registering on the portal, um, uploading content, creating a basic metadata template, which then triggers automatic ingest into our systems. We've got about 100 publishers registered almost, um, and we've received about 1,000 books and 300 or so journal issues. have the URL of the small publishers in the room. Um, we need to further develop our capacity and capability. We're really just getting off the ground and print legal deposit continues almost unhindered because the default remains send us your books. Um, but as we get better we build our capability we we're looking to switch more and more to a digital deposit world. What I haven't mentioned is the British Library is under increasing financial pressures as well to handle the content and, uh, and our workforce and staffing levels are very much diminished. Um, so the nature of this digital UK publishing, the continuing historic links between the legal deposit libraries and the need for increasing efficiencies together mean that future collection development will always operate in the framework of collaboration between all six libraries. The libraries will set a broad collecting policy jointly, whilst also having more detailed approaches geared to their own particular constituencies. Saving what is at risk will be key, either because of the frailty of it being made e-only, or for example of it being published beyond the mainstream, a fugitive or an underground publication, with no guarantee of self-archiving or continuous. However, we're all take, already taking mainstream publications in, and these will continue to form the backbone of our future collecting. The transition to a legal deposit regime for non printed materials is still very much in its infancy. Basic change will be governed by the continued evolution in publishing and the capability and capacity within the legal deposit libraries to preserve UK's digital published output for current and future generations of research. And that's me. I hope that's given you a top level flavour where we think we are at the moment. Some small successes, but we think uh, we're capable of uh, building on and working with the publishing world to, to make a digital deposit world happen. Have we got any questions? <laughs> <laughs>